I could show you a million experiences. I could show you the person that was abused or had an alcoholic father or a mother that didn't stand up and uh, defend them and now they're opposed to the weakness within the feminine model and all these hidden. We have a hidden reservoir of resentment towards what we consider the betrayed part of ourselves. Well, have you ever looked at what you were really betrayed by? It was the weaknesses within human beings. We then start to classify human beings by their weaknesses. That justifies us trashing them or attacking them historically. I deal with reality. I deal with the real world, not the make-believe. So when someone in our society tells me they're not affected by their experiences, I say they become their experiences. And that's why we exclude interrelating. That's why we exclude integrating concepts. That's why both religions and institutions exclude people who are not a part of their beliefs. Not because they've had any experience with this. It's because they have been influenced to have their beliefs molded by this, even when it's not their own experience. That's how powerful these are. How many times have you not trusted a man because of something has happened to you at some point? You were lied to, you were hurt, and now there's an automatic mistrust. Has that happened to any of the women in this room? Yeah. But is that fair? It's not fair. But that's what happens when we become our experience. Then we hide it. And the more clever you are, the better able you are to make it seem as if it's a completely rational and reasonable way of dealing. And then you start saying that it's not, that we exclude ourselves from being balanced. You see, the moment you exclude yourself from being balanced in life, then for all intents and purposes, you have no life. All you have is a reaction to your experiences. So we become reactionary. So most of our life each day is live reactionarily, live defensively. Now that brings us to the next issue, and that is list the ways in which you live each day defensively. What do you do that's defensive? Because you cannot master life living defensively. You cannot be vulnerable that way. And a lack of vulnerability is what keeps people fat, overweight, out of shape, keeps them stressed out, keeps them angry, keeps them locked in the past, keeps them making excuses, keeps them blaming the world for why their life isn't working. Unresolved defensive living. So we got to deal with this. This is that septic system we got in, got to go into. We got to uncover that septic system. We got to go into our own biases, our own prejudices, our own conditioned belief, and we got to acknowledge it. <laughs> All right? We got to clean it out, or we're going to be forever taking it with us. And remember, when you are limited by believing in things that don't work, your ego and defense mechanism is going to continue to defend the merits of that. I mean, haven't you ever talked with people who just sound like absolute jerks because they're trying to defend something that even they know is indefensible? Talk with lawyers. They're masters at it. <laughs> they are. I have to talk with doctors all the time, and they're even better masters at it. Now, you say you gave this woman uh, in the state of Illinois, good example. I mentioned this on my Saturday show. They passed a law this year in the state of Illinois that made pregnancy a condition. Officially, it's a condition to which the doctor exclusively, the obstetrician and gynecologist, is the cure. Therefore, even though the New Mexico health study showed after 11 years that midwives had a half death rate compared to obstetric birth, that they had only 5% to the 95% cesarean section, they had almost zero episiotomies that the obstetrician had. At far less the cost and at healthier babies, they were excluded from participating in that process of birth in the state of Illinois by law. Now, that is simply a wrong belief. The fact that it was made into a law institutionalizes it. You see, and we have this belief that if something is the law, it is above reproach. Well, of course, we also have a challenge to the laws, and the law is amended. But when people want to defend the merits of their belief, they'll make something the law. And unfortunately, we tend to be more uh, focused on obeying the law than we do looking at the merits of the law to see, is the law just? 
Now, Thoreau said it best, when the law does not represent the best interest of the public, then you should challenge the law. But ask the average person, have they ever challenged the law, wrong laws, and they'll tell you no. Have you ever challenged anything that's wrong? And they'll tell you no. Well, how is it that you're not challenging quality of our food, our air, our soil? You're not challenging anything. It's because they haven't even challenged their own life. You know, if you're not challenging your own life and what doesn't work, how do you expect someone to reasonably challenge uh, what's outside of their own life? That's why we've got to take a look at this. Now, once you understand what it is that is defensive in your life, is reactionary, is merely a matter of pattern beliefs from your experiences, then you can recognize it and let it go. You can simply let it go. You forgive it. You forgive yourself. You forgive those you've, you've in any way harmed and you let it go, and then you can get on with your life. I just want to add one thing to the idea of don't become your experiences. Experiences are meant to give us an understanding of life by trying to get an understanding of how we can reflect upon something that's happened to us. I can't always change the experiences that have happened to me, if someone says something is not nice or someone says something is very nice, I can learn from them. I can change my perception of them. I have the right to decide how I'm going to integrate those into my perceptual uh, sense. I'm not going to become either one. Now, throughout life, we can learn from our experiences. We can learn how to grow as human beings. I believe that we learn as much from a negative experience as we do from a positive experience. But it doesn't mean we have to become negative because we've had a negative experience. How many times, for instance, in life has someone said something or done something to you that was very uncomplimentary, and then you started to feel bad about yourself? Well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to feel bad about yourself because someone wants you to feel bad about yourself. That's the way of someone manipulating you. And so frequently, people end up using the knowledge of how their manipulation of you will affect how you feel. Your self-esteem, your self-worth, all can be from an experience. But then that means that the experience is more essential to you than your own inner dynamic. All that these things should do is complement or give you an understanding of life. But to know one person from India who may or may not represent all the dynamics of India is not to know India or for that matter, is not to know Indians. I remember the first time a friend of mine went to a feminist lecture, I was invited to talk. I never got a chance to talk. Now, had they hear me talk, they would have heard what would have been more of the spiritual feminist perspective viewed through the male perspective. But these people at that meeting were not into hearing anything that was of a spiritual feminist nature. They were highly polemic. In fact, the woman who was ahead of it was a Marxist. She was a, uh, uh, she was a very much a revolutionary, and though some of her ideas certainly should have been uh, weighed, uh, her, she had a very hate, male-hating attitude. And I did not, and I told my friend, don't make a judgment about feminism and don't overreact to it, because if you overreact to it, then you can make statements or have feelings that continue to support a sexist position. She does not represent feminism. She represents a particular, radically political point of view. And it's not a human point of view. It's not a spiritual point of view. She has a right to that. And I could take you to a workshop where you would hear a completely different perspective. So you see, we end up making judgments about whole general concepts upon individual experiences, and we shouldn't. Allow them to be what they are, individual experiences. Now let's go to some of these additional skills and things we need. Who do you blame for your problems and feelings? If you're gonna master life and get your focus, if you're gonna have your desire and live your bliss, you gotta stop blaming. Just stop blaming. There's a person here tonight who I had the uh, experience of uh, counseling this past year. All this person did was complain. She blamed everything for everybody. <clears throat> First, she blamed that nothing ever started on time. 
in an environment where we said that nothing would start on time. <laughs> Day one of our orientation, nothing here starts on time. Turn in your watches, nothing's going to start on time. We don't want it to start on time. And what should she do? She complained all day, nothing's on time. So there comes a time when if we want to master life, we cannot master life in blame. Do you ever notice something? The people who are always out there trying and learning, they'll make more mistakes than anyone could ever imagine, and they never blame, they just get back up and do it again. The blamers are the people when they try and they fall, it's like falling in cement. They get stuck to their failure. All they look at is the pain and anger of their failure, and then they blame. Once you get caught into blaming, you don't grow. You stop. That's life. It's over. You show me someone who blames, and I'll show you someone who hasn't grown since the day they blame. They, nothing. It's over. Their life is stopped. Dead. You don't grow one inch from the day you blame. Show me someone in your life who's grown since they blame. Show me one person. You know one? Do you? No. You cannot. It is not possible to grow if all you're doing is blame because you're looking for blame before you do anything. You need an out. So your mind is distracted from what you're doing, looking for the way out before you even do something. Your commitment isn't to doing something with an idea that, okay, I'm going to make mistakes. Okay, I'm going to fail. Okay, it's all right. It's part of life. Hey, it's part of how I'm going to grow and part of how I'm going to learn. Someone comes in, twice I get an infusion right in the vein. They miss the vein. They go through. They get me in the muscle. You get 100,000 milligrams of vitamin C going in your muscle. You feel it. Person gets very nervous. I said, don't get nervous. It's okay. Hey, I couldn't expect, it'd be unreasonable for me to expect you to hit my vein every time. Don't worry about it. Pain's going to go away. My confidence in you haven't, hasn't been reduced. I'm not blaming you. It's okay. It's just a human mistake. But the moment Virginia Reed and I, who's uh, one of the best dancers in America, she's, a, and she's one of the nicest human beings you'd ever meet. She, she's a lot of fun. But again, she's very successful at life because she does what she wants. You know, she's a dynamic woman. I mean, she's out there, and you'd never guess. She's about 47 years old, and she has the body of a 20-year-old. She's about six foot three, and she is probably the best female dancer I've ever seen in America. And, and uh, she's a psychologist and a sociologist and a, a body therapist and a feminist. But when she starts to dance, then she turns the whole place on. The moment she started to dance, and she dances really sexy, suddenly, the whole room changed, and everybody started to loosen up. In effect, it was like, oh, we've got permission now to, you know, to do some funky stuff and move around. And, and everybody started getting hot, hot dancing. Up until that point, it was like, oh, you know, boring dancing, boring dancing. Then it just changed, because one person was willing to take a chance. And when you're really doing great dancing, and you're free, you don't think about making mistakes. You don't think about you know, slipping and falling or bumping into people. You just do it. Where someone who's afraid of the consequences is always going to be more interested in the image they're projecting uh, than in letting go. So you've got to, at some point, realize that without the risk being taken, there's no reward that's going to be gained. What risks are you willing to take? No risks, no rewards. Small risks, small rewards. Take a big risk, big reward. And when you develop the right attitude, you're not going to be afraid of taking some major risks. The people I know whose life succeed have taken thousands of risks, had thousands of failures, but they got a lot of rewards. They're the people who succeed at life. I've never met anyone who succeeds in master's life who hasn't taken the risks. Play it safe, no mastery. No success, no happiness. If people want it both ways. Well, I want to be healthy, but I don't want to work on it. I want to be trim and strong, but I don't want to exercise. I want to be a peace of mind, but I don't want to do any stress management techniques. Well, I want to be successful, but I don't want to work hard at being successful. Can't have it both ways. Do you accept limitations? And what limitations do you accept? Now remember, up to this point, you may think that, that no, 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 I don't, you know, I mean, well, maybe a few. Uh, and then you start to see your whole life is bounded by limitations. How real are those limitations? Who put them there? How long they've been there? What have you done to adapt to the limitations? 
I remember the first time you came to the park, you told me what you couldn't do. You didn't tell me what you could. Remember that day? I don't, I don't think, and you start, the moment you start saying, I don't think, remember I stopped you and I said, then why are you here? I can't work with people who start off, I don't, I can't. Then you're right, you can't and you don't. I start to work with people who say, will do, can do, here I am, let's do it. It's no big deal. I mean, it's simple. It's simple. The people who want to do, do it. The people who don't, make excuses. Start to listen to how people talk. Listen to the excuses. Now, limitations should not be set before you try something. Otherwise, your conditioned response, which is your experiences and the input of other people to you, will already dictate what you're willing to even try, and artificial limitations are placed in front of you. Think of how many senior citizens in our society have never been into a health club and press weights or lifted because a limitation of social uh, image was placed there and they couldn't mix with the younger culture and it wasn't something they should be doing. In other words, if you get old, you shouldn't be working on your body. You should be taking your Geritol, you know, your suppositories for your hemorrhoids, <laughs> right? I mean, that's the image, right? I mean, when was, realistically, when was the last time you saw someone in a, you know, Jack Lane about 80 years old, pumping iron. Now, I'm sure there must be a few, but we've got, you know, 40 million senior citizens. I don't see 40 million people out there. I doubt there are 40,000 out there doing it, but those who do it have enormous benefits. Balancing the unconscious with the conscious so that all your unconscious thoughts and aspirations that sometimes peekaboo through, you know, they'll come up in a quiet moment, unguarded moment, when your defense mechanisms are down, those moments are the inspired moments. That's where suddenly you suddenly realize something and you didn't figure it out. You just knew it. There's a knowing that comes without teaching, without learning. That's the inside. When you have a thought where you can write out a, a poem, where you have the answer to something, where you didn't have the formula to figure it out, that's the unconscious speaking to you. When things have happened, I don't know if they've happened to you, but they've happened my whole life. When I surrender the need to control something and I place my faith in its resolution and its resolve, I've had these things happen too often to think that there were coincidences where nothing was there to resolve it, but suddenly it was resolved. And it's through the surrender of complete trust that things happen. But a lot of times people don't trust. And it's only when you do trust that you're allowing the unconscious to connect with the conscious. And then your conscious deeds have to honor the unconscious. And those are the people who make consistently right decisions. If you said, ah, oh, there's a wallet, I wouldn't steal that. I could steal it, and I wouldn't get caught, but I wouldn't steal it. And it's not because of guilt. It's because it's not right. Now, even if I was not taught not to steal, my inner teacher has that knowledge. And the inner teacher has all the knowledge. I have to honor that. So I wouldn't steal. It wouldn't matter. Other people would say, well, you're stupid. You know, that's, that's an advantage. And the consequences are, are to your advantage. Well, I can't live my life based upon me profiting at someone else's loss. That's not ethical. It doesn't honor a universal reality. And if things don't honor a universal reality, uh, but only my own limited reality, then I'm no better than the person who kills another person because their god is supposed to be the god of all gods, and so in the name of Jihad, they're willing to kill other people, men, women, and children, to honor their god and their life or their nation or their football club or whatever it is they're honoring without looking at the larger reality. That's what happens when we don't listen to that inner voice. Now, it's not an inner voice you can be taught to listen to. It's not from a textbook. It comes from the surrender. And it's a hard principle when everything in life we've been taught to do is never surrender to anything, to always hold on, hold on, hold on. That means we hold on to our fears, we hold on to our limitations, we hold on to our experiences, we hold on to our reactions, we hold on to our defense mechanisms. You hold on to all that, nothing on the inside is ever going to come through. Nothing is going to teach you about life. And that's what you have to learn from, is the heart. So I believe that you have to assess your limitations with a new eye. Look at the limitations not from the old self, the conditioned self, but look at limitations from the new self. The new self that says, 
You say I can't do something, well, maybe because I've never done it, in which case you're right. I'm saying I want a chance to try it. And if I don't succeed, okay, I don't succeed. So what? I'm not going to feel bad about it, but I'm going to try it. It's trying that makes the difference, not succeeding. Success is going to be a rare commodity in life. And if we plan everything upon success or failure, we shouldn't be engaged in anything. It's doing it, trying it. Life is a process. It's every day that counts, not just when we get to a goal that counts. What, do you ha what have you conquered and what and um, why that previously limited, I should say, what have you conquered that had previously limited you? And how did you do it? We have to look at what we've done in life that has been a limitation before but now isn't. When you look at a failure, what do you see? What do you feel? That's very important. These are all stages of our growth. If you look at a failure and what you see is yourself and how other people see you, the likelihood is you're not going to try anything again. If you look at a failure and simply say it's another experience, it's okay, I'm going to learn from it, then you use your failures as a way of growing. Remember, you're going to have a hundred failures for each success. But let your failures be play. Let everything you do be a form of play. So that you're playing even at failing. So it doesn't become serious. I remember a friend, buddy of mine in high school, when we'd play intramural basketball, he would just get all bent out of shape when he lost a game got to the point where no one wanted to play against it because he wouldn't talk to him for a week after the game. Well, there are only so many people you can play against in high school. <laughs> Losing up games, you won't be talking to anybody. And so I got him aside one day and I said, you know, Ron, you're taking this too seriously. It's just a game. You know, just have fun with it. He said, no, it's a game to you, Gary. It's not a game to me. I take this stuff seriously. I said, Ron, you take this attitude. You know what's going to happen to you when you go out, we get out of high school and we get into the real world. You know, it's, it, you're going to alienate yourself from a lot of people. Eight years later, this guy after high school and college became a drug addict, alcoholic, destroyed his life, his marriage, his children. Everything he did, he had to w do to win. Anything that was perceived of as a failure, he had to first deny and then get angry and blame someone else for. He never learned to have fun even with failure. Remember. Most of everything in life doesn't succeed, so what? Have fun with it. You know, it's interesting, when I was uh, doing a cooking class once, I went to make this, uh, went to make this uh, special type of uh, bread that the Greeks make, and it's a pastry bread, and it was making, shown the ways of making it, and the darn thing wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't uh, hold up. And every time we'd make it, it'd be flat. And the amazing thing it was, it was delicious, crunchy, and sweet, and everybody ate every piece of it, right? Nobody minded it didn't rise. It was good, right? So what, right? We make too much of this. Of all your fears, which ones stop you from self-actualization? You've got to write down your fears that stop you because those are the ones you've got to space, pay special attention to. When I was talking earlier about the limited self always hinders the positive self. Let me ask you something. Have you ever had this happen to you? You've perfected almost a, a perfect part of yourself, you know, you, the part that uh, seems nice and, and, and successful and or, or pleasant. And then one day something happens and boy, you show another side of yourself and people just pull back from you. And you realize that now they don't have the same attitude about you. They see another part of you. And so there's a part of them that's always tempered. They're never going to have that same complete trust in you because of that side they saw. And sometimes it's a long time before you see that part of a person. That was the hidden part. That was that under the water part that we try to disguise. We try to disguise our weaknesses, our fears, our limitations. But ultimately, 
That is what will determine the quality of any of the things we do, including our relationships. So that's what you got to work on. If you don't, you're always going to be brought back to that limited self. Remember, it's the limited self that destroys your relationships. It's the limited self that destroys your career, not the positive self. And yet we don't spend time looking at ways of resolving the limited self. So list your fears. What past events and feelings or beliefs do you still engage which continue to limit you? Write them down, focus on them, and then break the patterns. If one of the patterns that, uh, is that you're persistently late, then make a point of getting up early so you make your appointments. If one of them is that you are always overeating because you're eating out in a restaurant, then make a point of eating at home. If you don't break the patterns, you're going to continue the patterns. So you've got to break the patterns to create new, healthier patterns. So this week, our whole idea is to break old patterns, to change them. What price do you pay for success and health? It's not just what happens when you become successful to yourself. It's what you now have as an image in the minds of other people. We have a system in our society where we give people success. And once we start to make people successful, we almost throw more praise on them than what they deserve, give them more than what they could ever use. Just like these two pugilists who are going to bat batter each other's brains are going to make a total of about $100 million cumulatively in a fight. That's more than we've given all of our Nobel Prize winners in history but we will give two people to go out in, into a ring and beat each other to death. Something's terribly wrong with that scenario. That shows socially the wrong values, what we value. Isn't it? Now, what is very fearful this process is that if you don't fight as a fighter, you are stripped of your crown. You cannot, in many of the areas in our society, you cannot take a step back. You cannot control your own success because you lose your marketability. And I can tell you from many different areas, because I am creative in many different areas, for instance, in broadcasting, the moment you go off the air, no matter how popular you were or are, it's almost impossible to get back on again because it's a very controlled medium. And there are millions of people trying to get on. And when you're off, uh, sometimes I've seen people go off who've never gotten back on again. In television, it's the same way. In writing, if you're not currently popular in publishing, you're forgotten about because there are 12,000 other authors coming up, unless you're a name. Now, if you're a name, you can get away with doing a, a film like a Marlon Brando occasionally. But most of the people out there, they don't know how to say no because they're afraid that there is a shortage. We've been led to believe that success is a limited commodity and that the spoils that come with success is a limited commodity, that the public is very fickle. And if you start to fail at anything that you're doing, the public will withdraw its support of you. We don't like to be associated with someone on their way down, only on their way up. We're fascinated and curious about the way down, but we won't support anyone going back up. In other words, we don't stop someone and take them back up. We're very vicarious. We give them artificial support when they're up and give them complete uh, withdrawal when they're on their way down. And it terrifies people. It makes them very insecure about the very success they've achieved. You know, I, I train people who are in their uh, uh, 50s, 60s, and 70s for the senior games. And they were told they were too old to compete. Now they're all national and world champions. You know, I just took Dolores Perry out to do the uh, championships in uh, Princeton two weeks ago. And in West Point this past Saturday, she won a gold medal in both. Now she has two gold medals before she had the limitation. She's too old to compete. I said, look at you. Why are you too old? You think you're too old. You're not too old to compete. Well, once she got it in her mind that she wasn't too old, then she had desire to do it. The desire had been there all along. How many times did you fantasize about winning something and being good? It had been there. The desire had been there, but then the fear of failing and what it would be like to come in dead last. And nobody wants to be the last person in. The same thing. You found it in yourself, Dolores. Dolores was afraid that her form wouldn't be perfect when she did it. And as a result, she held herself back. Now, the next time she did it, she opened herself up more and she went faster. Each time that she gets more confidence that she can go faster, she'll allow herself to go faster. How many times in life have we had the desire, the skills, the ambition to do something, and we held ourselves back out of fear that we would fail? So when we get through the fear, then we allow ourselves to take a chance. And then we get into it. And when we're into it, we learn from being in it. The moment there's doubt up here, 
it registers as constriction in here. You're held back. When you're held back, then you end up regretting what you've done. And then regret becomes a form of self-blame. And self-blame becomes a form of self-condemnation. Self-condemnation becomes a form of, of holding yourself in place. When you don't deal with that, you just say, okay, you know, it was what it was. You go back out and you say, now I'm going to really get relaxed. I'm going to fly. I don't care what anyone says, I'm going to go as fast as I can. And then suddenly you're just flying. You're just moving. And it's an exhilaration. There's no way to explain it. It just, you open up and you just move. And the more you move, the faster you are, the more balanced you are. You're just in perfect rhythm. Your whole body is just moving in, in perfect strides. You stretch your legs out longer than they've ever stretched. Your body just bounces in. And that's what happens when you don't care about losing, failing. You just care about being in the moment and going with it. And I'm sure everyone in this room has had moments in your life where you've absolutely been in the moment and you've had a great time being there, where you didn't fear what you were doing. You just let yourself happen in anything, sports, anything, just being in the moment. And that's what we're talking about. So you see, we do pay a price for our success. And that's why I said that anything that we do, we should always balance it with a knowledge of its opposite. You see, here's one other thing. For every person who is successful, part of what fear they have in being successful is the knowledge of what it is not to be successful and the knowledge of what it is not to have what they now have. In effect, to go back to what they were before. It's always there. And nobody wants to go back to where they were. So there's almost a obsessive and compulsive need to stay fixated on what it takes to keep successful. Whereas the healthier way is to balance that and say, hold on a second. Success is more than financial. Success is more than the public adulation. Success is how I feel and what I'm gaining from this on non-material levels, on spiritual levels, on emotional levels. And one thing success does give you in America, it gives you access. People suddenly pay attention to you. Whether you deserve it or not, people pay attention to you. And ironically, sometimes people don't want that attention because they don't have anything to give. The attention is you know, shown on people and they've been given this limelight when they really haven't done anything that unique to deserve it, and they know it. But other cases, some success gives you a chance to grow in the ways that other people wouldn't want to hear from you. In any area of life, you can have that. As long as you know where you've been, don't let that be the reason that you continue to go forward. Go forward because you want to learn and enjoy life. If you're only motivated by your fear, then you're still a prisoner and you're not balanced, and you're not mastering anything. For this week, I'd like you to focus on this issue. To get everyone started on changing their life I'd like you each morning, every morning, to write on a piece of paper and put it up on your mirror, uh, on your refrigerator, at work, a little sign that says, I've had it. <laughs> right? I've had it. Have you ever said that in your life? Yes. Have you? <laughs> I've had it. Right? Now, in that moment when you say, I've had it, what happens? That's generally the only time you're honest about everything, right? I've had it. I've stopped this craziness. I've had it. I'm out of here. Goodbye. I'm changing this. There's no more of this crap. It's when we reach our threshold. Where it's the last straw. That's it. We've tolerated as much abuse or indifference or imbalance as we can, and we say, I've had it. That's enough. Do you know how many people end up going to a holistic doctor when they suddenly said, I've tried it. I've had it. It didn't work. Well, why didn't they go there first? You know, when they still had a good chance of succeeding. Why not go to a relationship that works from day one and always feels good, where you never have to say, I had it, because every day you're getting good feedback, good support, good emotions. What about going to work each day where you enjoy the work, where you're happy to get up and look at the work? He's laughing. <laughs> it's possible. 
It's fun to be engaged in something that you're the architect of and you're responsible for, and every day you add something new and beautiful to it. But it generally starts when you've had it. So each day, make it happen. Make the end. Make the final straw and say, I've had it. All right, now you've had it. What have you had? What are you going to change? Because if you don't do that, then there's a big buffer zone. Remember, we're extremely adaptable. We keep adapting to what doesn't work. You know, it doesn't work. We twist, we twist, we turn. We look all contorted emotionally because we've adapted to so many differences that aren't us. So straighten up and say, I've had it. I'm not wearing anything that doesn't, I don't like. I'm not going to say anything I don't believe. I'm not going to do anything that doesn't honor life then just right up there, what honors life today, that's what I'm going to do. If it doesn't honor life, I'm not doing it. And if you don't honor me, you're out of here. You're out of my life. I've had it. Right? Now, you might find yourself alone. <laughs> Tell us how, what it's like. <laughs> I spent a lot of time alone. It was funny. Some, some woman said, Gee, Gary, uh, uh, my mother said that you look suave, but you're probably gay. <laughs> Why? Because I'm alone. Well, I'm not gay. I'm alone because unless I have a relationship that accepts me completely for who I am and that my first requirement in life is life, my first obligation is living my life and living for myself, second would be what I could give to a relationship. If I can't meet the person who can accept that, then I'd rather have no one in my life because my life works with just me and my friends. But other people, that's not right. I mean, you must be lonely waking up alone. You must be lonely eating alone. No, <laughs> not at all. Hey, I have only my breath to smell in the morning. Yeah. Hey. If I found the right person who was like that, yeah, then I'd have a relationship. But to put something in your life that doesn't work just to fill it is no good. And there comes a time when you have to make a decision, what do you want in your life? And if it's not right for you, get it out. And don't be motivated by guilt and fear, because if you're motivated by guilt and fear, you'll never change anything. You'll just keep it in here, and you keep it in here, there's no mastery of anything. There's just obedience to the pain from the past. And that's what this course is about, letting you have the courage and giving you the direction to say yes to what works and no to what doesn't. So make a with what list. I've had it with what. And each morning, list what you've had it with because then you can start the process of changing that. But if you don't say I've had it, you're not going to change it.